I come to this work from, a, I think, a, a very lucky path. Um, I'm the son of a superintendent uh, and vowed I would never, ever go into education uh, for as long as I lived. Um, and, and actually wound up going to the University of Washington to study engineering. I wanted to build spaceships uh, when I was in college. Uh, and about halfway through, I thought, I don't know, there's nobody in space. I don't, how much am I gonna get to work with people on these kinds of things? Um, and meanwhile, I was working towards a degree in theater arts at the same time uh, and thought, I'm never gonna be happy if I just do engineering. So I wound up going into mathematics education, found myself in a principalship years later, and um, by the grace of whomever, um, wound up on the writing team for the math standards, which I have to tell you um, was the most um, human, and politically challenging experience I have ever had for all of the right reasons. Um, there were so many different perspectives that people brought to that process, so many different deeply held beliefs um, about math, about children, about public education, um, that the product in the end, I felt like um, really was the coming together of lots of disparate views to create um, what I have come to believe is a really stunning vision, right, for what students can do in mathematics. Um, what I wanna talk about this morning uh, is what all of that means from a leadership perspective, uh, and in particular through the lens of democracy uh, and equity and the work that you all do. Um, um, I was going back through some things that I've read in the past, and this is a Malcolm Gladwell quote, and I, and I think what's important about it um, is the very last phrase, right, that we all are a lot more susceptible to outside influences than we may realize. And I think that's true in particular for younger kids, right? Uh, and I think that puts upon us, particularly in mathematics education, I'll tell you why I think particularly for mathematics education in a moment, uh, quite a responsibility. Um, kids, if any, for those of you who have children, you know that they hear what you do far more than what you say. Um, they pick up on all of the subtle cues that you provide them, uh, definitely as parents, and I think certainly as teachers, as leaders in our buildings, uh, and as leaders uh, in, the, in, the, in the systems that some of you may run. Um, so I think it's important to remember this, uh, this piece of information that we influence even though we may not realize we are influencing. Um, and then, you know, a, a hero of mine from early on, Sir Francis Bacon, right? N knowledge is power. Uh, this is an old idea. As I was researching this idea, I found quotes dating back to um, centuries BC, right? And uh, this is the one that is most often quoted. Uh, but it, it really is, I think, at the heart of why, at least in part, we do mathematics education. Um, we are trying to open doors for kids. Uh, we're trying to make sure they have access to do what it is that they want to do when they leave our systems. Uh, and without a doubt, reading, you got to be able to read, and math, you got to be able to do math. And believe it or not, that idea, that second idea, that we have to be able to do math has been a long, hard-fought battle that continues. Um, recently, I have been, um, keeps moving on me, doesn't it? Um, I've recently been reading a book called Sapiens. Have any of you read Sapiens? Okay, I, I strongly encourage you to read this book. Um, I am a big fan of anthropology and sociology when I'm not um, doing my work and playing with my kids, and it is uh, what uh, the author Hariri uh, refers to as a brief history of mankind. Uh, and in the very beginning, he talks about what is it that set Homo sapiens apart from other humanoid species at the time. Uh, Neanderthals, uh, uh, Australopithecus, uh, Australopithecus afarensis, um, the Denosovans, right, other humanoids that have since left our planet. And you know, what, what, what they have found, right, through, um, through their research, and there are, there are a variety of different theories on this, but what they found is the gift that sapiens, homo sapiens have 
that the others did not was, believe it or not, the gift of gab, that our ability to gossip is what set us apart. And, and, and if you follow the thread, right, what is it about gossip that matters, right? It's a sharing of information. It's a sharing of nuanced information. It is, at its very root, storytelling, right? So when we look at mathematical knowledge, right, what is mathematical knowledge, right? Um, it's understanding concepts, right? And it's being able to flexibly use mathematics to solve problems. You know, we get so in the weeds sometimes with math, right? How, you know, um, what's the place value system? How are we gonna work with fractions? What do we mean by proportional reasoning and ratios, right? What about, you know, what the heck do triangles have to do with slope of a line? And my God, mx plus y equals mx plus b one more time. Um, that we forget why we do mathematics in the very first place. Right? We do it to solve problems. You know, mathematics was invented, this is also in the book, mathematics was invented for accounting, right? It was, saw, it was trying to solve an accounting problem, particularly around agriculture. Um, <clears throat> and now, of course, we know it does so many other things, but it's important, I think, to remember that we do mathematics to solve problems. Um, the more mathematics we know, the more problems we can solve, the more problems we can solve, the more choices we get with what we choose to do with our lives. The more we're able to interact in a civic society, the more we're able to discern, as Dr. King talked about earlier in the week. Um, we also, when we talk about mathematical knowledge, want kids to have easy facility with arithmetic uh, and later algebraic and geometric procedures. Um, and historically, that has been pretty much what we've done in math, right? We're gonna invert and multiply, we're gonna foil, right? We're gonna, we're gonna enact so many procedures because that's how we conceived of mathematics. But I will tell you that we do those things so that kids can do the things that I've talked about above, that they can understand concepts, that they can solve problems, Procedures are a means to an end. So for those of you who are in the leadership pathway and you participate, and, and if you're new to the leadership pathway, um, you're gonna be talking a lot more about rigor today. Uh, for those of you who, have, who are returning to the leadership pathway, um, some of this should be ringing familiar to you and you're gonna get to dig in even more uh, today and tomorrow in mathematics. Um, but the procedure, which is what um, I'm gonna make up a number right now, right? Mathematicians are good at that. Procedures are, and, and the teaching of procedures, I would say are 80 to 90% of what I see happening most often in classrooms, right? Even when what we're trying to do is teach concepts. <clears throat> so we're great at telling stories. And without a doubt, we tell stories and there are uh, prevailing stories in our country about mathematics. Um, here are some of the top ones. Um, it's a gift. Either you are a math person or not. Girls can't or shouldn't do math or are supposed to be good at math. English language learners should not be in my math class. Kids of color will never be in honors or AP or advanced math classes. That story doesn't get said out loud very much anymore, but when you look at registrations and enrollments and different courses, this story is well alive. Here's the great thing about stories. You can change them. You can change the stories and the stories that you choose to tell can become the reality of the work that you do in schools. So here are some different stories, right? These, I think, have been stories of oppression. Who gets access to math and who doesn't? And by the way, if you wanna make an economic argument, the people who get access to math are the ones who have all the power. They have all the money, they're the ones controlling our computers, they're the ones controlling our iPhones, our Androids, they're controlling what goes up on our televisions, they're the ones who are lying with statistics. Sometimes they tell the truth with them. So make no mistake about it, mathematical knowledge is power. So who's getting it? Here are some facts, right? Not stories. Here are some facts 
about acquiring mathematical knowledge. Perseverance matters. It matters so much it was the very first thing that was written when the standards were written. Did you know that the first thing that was written were the practices in the standards? Right? The practices got written first, and then these progressions were written, right? the progressions of content from beginning to end, and then the standards were written based on those progressions. Narrative, narrative stories of how math progresses over time. The very first practice that was written was making sense of and persevering and solving problems. So the, I recognize that there, depending on how we talk about perseverance, it can be a loaded term. So let me try to unload it, right, and just say we want kids to work through challenging problems, especially when they're challenging, right, to not give up as they are working through the problems, nor to bail them out before they've had an opportunity to grapple with the tasks. When they do that, they find more and more success with mathematics. High quality instruction makes all the difference in the world. You know this, right? There are pedagogies that work in teaching mathematics, and there are pedagogies that are less effective, right? This is not new information. This has been well researched. High quality instruction makes all kinds of differences when it comes to who gets access to mathematical knowledge. Content knowledge, content, your content knowledge, your teacher's content knowledge, your curriculum director's content knowledge. It, um, in my experience, um, many leaders, in particular in the elementary grades, are wonderful literacy coaches. Great expertise in reading, right? Um, they love teaching kids how to read. Um, many of them, not all, Right? For sure not all, but many of them also prefer not to do math if they don't have to. Right? Um, but I, but I, I want to encourage you to start telling a new story that of course we should all be doing mathematics. Of course we should all be learning how to um, work with kids with tape diagrams. Right? And understanding just exactly what the concept of dividing two fractions in fifth grade really is. That one's not easy, by the way, but you can get it. Everybody can, right? But it takes some time and a willingness, right, to start telling a new story about who's accessing the mathematical content knowledge. Um, pedagogical content knowledge, right? There are certain things that those who are teaching mathematics need to know about teaching mathematics, right? Productive struggle, right, is one that the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics likes to talk an awful lot about. How can you, um, or mathematical discourse in the classroom, how can you um, generate those things and gender those things in the classroom so that kids are actively making meaning, right? They're actively working through problems instead of sitting and getting, right, information about the mathematics. Um, sitting and getting is great for short-term memory, not so great for long-term memory. Right, so these facts, they tell a very different story about getting access to mathematical knowledge than the ones that I think we hear most often. Um, they also, I think, see this is the thing about these stories, right? They start to dig into how we identify ourselves, right? They take on who we think we are or who we think we're supposed to be or what our place might be in our profession. Um, but once we start changing the story to everyone needs to know mathematics, everybody needs to, everybody needs to know mathematics, right? Lots more kids are going to get access to it and be successful with it and get more choices when they're done with the K-12 system. So this is, this is my point, right? Authentic access to mathematical knowledge creates new powerful paths towards self-determination and maybe even freedom itself. People who know a lot of math get to call their own shots. How do we do mathematical knowledge, right? We need to make sure we have great materials. And if you don't have great materials, we need to make them great as quickly as possible or find new ones. Uh, we do great instruction, including the pliable use of materials. Um, I was, and I, I feel so terrible that I've forgotten your name, but I was speaking with um, uh, one of the leadership facilitators, uh, sorry, no, one of the ELA facilitators yesterday, um, and she said, it was a wonderful quote, she said that um, the people who are stuck, the teachers who are stuck, uh, 
in complying with their curriculum, only complying with their curriculum, are the ones who don't know their content. Right, so when, and this is true in math for sure also, right, that when the teachers know a lot of math and their supervisors and their district leaders know enough math to start asking the right questions, right, then we start using materials more pliably, right, meeting the needs of the kids who are in front of us, finding ways to accelerate them back up as necessary, finding ways to provide extensions if necessary, right, we're not, we're not beholden to the material, the material's beholden to us. We're beholden to the kids and making sure they're finding success. And great support, supervision, and leadership. Um, how many of you have heard of the math wars? Have you experienced the math wars? Sort of like the clone wars, right? Um, the math wars, I'm glad not many of you have heard of them, but the, the because maybe something good is happening, but the math wars uh, were alive and well in the 90s and early 2000s. Uh, and on one side were mathematicians who believed that um, direct instruction, Saxon math, right, constant repetition of procedure, um, attention to algorithm all the time was the only math that kids should know. On the other side were the math educators who believed that the only math that kids should learn was through constructivism, inquiry-based instruction, right? And they fought, and they fought, and they fought. And it tore school districts apart. It made materials adoption nearly impossible, a, politically, um, a political powder keg in most school districts where this was going on. Um, what the standards have done is said, we're going to do both. We're going to make sure that the standards have in them the procedures that kids need to be successful. We're going, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. We're going to make sure that the standards have in them opportunities for kids to have experience with concepts and get to know concepts. And we're going to make darn sure that kids are applying what they're learning, and as they get older, they're actually modeling with mathematics or taking real life problems and mathematizing them. Um, it's important that you know these things. You know that these are in the standards. They're not always called out directly. I mean, we have the shift of rigor, which talks about them. But what's important about the pieces of rigor is not just what they are, but the fact that they're all in there, which is giving kids access to a complete set of mathematical knowledge. Yeah, I bolded that to remind you. So, <clears throat> um, I'm a math teacher at heart, um, and I oftentimes find myself in the weeds, right? I get right down, and, and, and we are going to do a little bit of math today. Um, it's, but for the most part, I want to stay at the level of the forest instead of getting too stuck in the trees. Um, most of the time when we think about math education, we're doing the trees. We're going to study counting. And four weeks later, we're going to study shape. And three weeks later, we're going to study number patterns, right? We, we, we look at one tree at a time, right? When particularly in your role as leaders in your, in, in your, um, in your buildings or in your districts, um, you need to know about the trees, right? But you also need to really be attending to the forest, right? Making sure that we're looking at all of these pieces together and seeing how they're operating. So on, the, on your left-hand side are tree issues. Right? And I'm not going to talk about them today. You're going to get access to these issues um, in your own professional learning, right? as you take responsibility for learning more mathematics yourselves. Uh, you're going to get access to them in the leadership pathway work. Some of you got it yesterday and a little bit more today. Others of you are going to get it today and tomorrow. Some of you uh, are getting it all week. Um, and, and I'm just, I'm not going to talk about it today, but I wanted to put them up there for you so that you could make a note, right, attend to them uh, as necessary. They matter tremendously, particularly the second bullet, attending to the systemic barricades. Um, I'm gonna come at that actually from a slightly different perspective in a moment when I talk about tasks. I wanna talk about the forest issues though, those things on the right-hand side. Um, and I want you to learn a little bit today about the hidden structures in the standards. I'm not gonna ask you to memorize standards, uh, I'm not going to ask you to deconstruct any standards, but I want you to know about the structures that are in there um, that oftentimes do not get talked about because they, they do, in their own way, provide a map of how to engage with the standards. They make use of structure 
right, and looking at the standards themselves. So we're going to talk a little bit about progressions. We're going to talk a little bit about the interplay between standards and coherence. Uh, and then we're really, and we're going to finish with uh, what is most important actually in the end. It's where the rubber hits the road. It really is all about that task. Um, so the progressions, um, there, is, there are macro progressions. Um, and we refer to these as the streams. Um, here are all the domains in the math standards. Um, high school is on your right, and the earlier grades are on your left. Um, within these domains, there are stories being told in the mathematics. Um, the first is the counting and cardinality stream, which is very tiny, right? It happens in kindergarten only, but if you cannot count, Right? And if you cannot understand what counting on is, and if you do not understand ideas of ordinality as well, then the rest of the math is just not going to be accessible. Right? So we start with counting. The next stream is the algebraic thinking stream. So when you are looking at clusters or you are looking at domains that involve any of these, right, number and operations in base 10, Right, that winds up leading to the distributive property, by the way. Uh, operations and algebraic thinking right, takes us into expressions and equations. Right? Properties of operations turns into properties of equality, turns into algebra. Number and operations, fractions, right, becomes ratios and proportional reasoning, which becomes rates of change, which becomes slope, which becomes lots of other functions. Do you need to know all of those specific little things? No. Do you need to know that there's a very intentional progression of these ideas across K-12? Absolutely. And why do you need to know? So that you can ask the right questions. Tell me how what you're doing today fits into what kids are going to be doing in middle school. Tell me, seventh grade teacher, how proportional reasoning is going to connect with the work that kids are going to do in high school. And if your teachers don't know the answer, let's make sure they learn the answer. Because I am a true believer that if you do not know where you have been, and you do not know where you are going, then I'm not sure you can really know where you are. I heard somebody talk about we really want teachers to stay in their lanes, right, when it comes to mathematics. And it's true. We really want them to attend to the work that they're doing with kids in their grade level. But the work that they're doing with the kids in their grade level is interconnected with the work that's come before and the work that's coming after. So they need to know that too. They need to know where they're going and they need to know where kids have been. When I taught mathematics, I was constantly, I wound up, believe, I, this is, um, I'll tell you anyway, I wound up getting a job because there was a teacher in a particular building who, whose kids came out of every year with that teacher, um, completely confused, having lost almost an entire year of instruction. So I got hired specifically to follow those kids. I got all those kids the year after, and I had to teach them two years of content. Every year, I had to teach them two years of content. It was frustrating beyond belief, right? But we had to serve the kids who were in front of us. The only way that was possible was to know at least two years of content before even the one that I was doing, right? And it made all the difference. Right? Kids found a lot of success. Not all of them, unfortunately. I'm still haunted. Um, but most of them did find success as we accelerated them forward. Let's go back to the other deck. There are other streams, you guys, right? There's the number and quantity stream. There's the geometry stream. One of my colleagues loves geometry and is always on my case that I don't talk more about it. Um, geometry is crucial, particularly. He won't be surprised when I say this because of its connections to algebra. Um, shape. Shape matters. I just got invited, and I think I'm going to do it, I just got invited to apply for a gerrymandering course at Tufts University. It's a summer school course so that I can become an expert witness in gerrymandering cases. It's all about geometry. And, and I looked at that and I thought, my God, if ever there were a way for me to, um, to insert myself in civic discourse, right? <laughs> it is to get involved in that conversation, right? Because there is not a party in this country that is free from scandal when it comes to gerrymandering. So shape matters. So we talked about macro content, the streams, right? 
I answered the question, why should you care? Why should you care about that? So you can ask the right questions, right? Where are you? Where have kids been? Where are you going? There's also micro content. And I'm going to give you two examples, one from elementary school and one from middle school. Um, here's a huge idea that's in the standards. And it drove people crazy, particularly parents, for a long time um, until words started to get out. But the standards are built on uh, this principle over and over again, that kids should get experience with mathematics before they get formality. They should play with ideas before we lock them down right, with algorithms and procedures. And that is so their learning is sustainable. Right? Again, procedures are great for test prep, unfortunately. Great for test prep. But then guess what happens after the test? And guess what you wind up having to do the beginning of next year? Right? And guess what? Look at all the time you've lost. When kids understand concepts and, and learn how to flexibly use them, the procedures come and they're retained because they understand where they came from in the first place. So experience before formality. Here's an example in kindergarten. Uh, it's the first standard. Represent addition and subtraction with objects, fingers, mental images, drawings. Uh, we say a little bit more about that. Sounds, right? You can do some clapping, right? I'm going to do three. You clap three times. Um, acting out situations, verbal explanations. You see kindergarten kids running around, right? I need three groups of three, right? Go, um, right? This is experience with counting in kindergarten. I mean, literally, kids are making sense of counting with their whole bodies. And here's what it looks like later in kindergarten. Fluently add and subtract within five. So we're going to, at the beginning of kindergarten, we're going to give kids opportunities to add and subtract with objects, with their bodies, with sounds. By the end of grade five, though, we want them fluently adding and subtracting within five. That is a micro progression. Guess what we normally teach in kindergarten? We teach them to fluently add and subtract within five. We run right past the first standard. We run right past it. What a tragedy that in kindergarten, Kids aren't getting a conceptual understanding, a deep, organic, physical understanding of adding and subtracting. That to them, it's just a procedure in kindergarten. Now again, disclaimer, that's not how it is everywhere. Right? I've seen lots of classrooms, lots of kindergarten classrooms where that's not the case. But I hope you're asking yourself, is that happening in my rooms? Here's a middle school example. Still experience before formality. Um, sixth grade, expressions and equations. Uh, understand solving an equation or inequality as a process of answering a question, which values from a specified set, if there are any, right, make the equation or inequality true? Go ahead and use some substitution to determine whether a given number is a in a specified set makes the equation or inequality true. Right, just, let's just think about it, right? x plus 5 equals 10. What's x? You all know. Did you subtract the 5 from both sides? Or did you say, well, what number is plus 5 is going to be, right? That's what we're talking about here. Substitute 5 in, see what happens. Right, sixth grade, the beginning of the expressions and equations domain. Let's mess around with it. But then, in high school, maybe in eighth grade, depending on where you are, we hit them with A, R, E, I, 1. My favorite standard. Explain each step in solving a simple equation as follows from the equality of numbers asserted at the previous step. This is, re this is mathematicians love this one too, right? Because we say, we're not like going to let you take another step until you say, I'm going to assert that my numbers are equal here. I'm going to assert that x plus 5 equals 10 is true. Because I believe I can find a number that makes it true. Starting from the assumption that the original equation has a solution, and then talk about civic engagement, construct a viable argument to justify a solution method. Construct a viable argument. We argue all the time in math. At least I hope we do. We should be. 
constant argument and critiquing our own arguments and critiquing others' arguments, right? We're not having fist fights, right? We're not protesting each other, right? We're just saying, make an argument about why something is true. So again, in sixth grade, we're gonna let you mess around with the idea of an equation. We're gonna let you do some substitution. We're gonna take it easy on you, right? And in high school, you know, by now you should understand and you should be able to make arguments about why you did certain things, why certain equations are true, right, as you have solved them. Interplay and coherence, also one of my favorites. Remember when I talked about the trees? We're gonna do a little counting, and then we're gonna do some geometry, and then we're gonna do some patterns, right? There are nuanced realities of focus. How many of you know what the focus shift is in mathematics? Right, major, additional, and supporting. Right? Some clusters have the little green box, right? other ones have the yellow circle and the blue square. Blue square? Yeah. We had to fill them in and not fill them in. Do, it, do you guys know where the metaphor came from, where major additional and supporting came from? Do you want to know? Degree earning. Originally, when, the, when um, this actually came out of work that I was, I was lucky enough to be involved with, right? Um, originally, we had three tiers of standards, tier one, tier two, and tier three. Right? Everybody hated it. It was my idea. Everybody hated it, right? What, what are you talking about? Could you make it less interesting, right? And so got a group of people together and started thinking about what is a better way to describe this. So we talk about degree earning in college, right? When you earn a degree in college, you major in a particular area. That is where you spend most of your time studying. You take lots of different courses on it, right? Particle dynamics, statics, right? This was my engineering work. I'm just speaking from my own experience. Ta calculus, multivariable calculus, three-dimensional calculus, on and on and on. That was my major, right? It was fun um, un until it wasn't. Um, and then you take courses that are in support of your major, right? Um, for me, what, what, what I was taking in support of my major was a course called combinatorics, right? It was map theory. What's the quickest way to walk through a city from point A to point B? I didn't need it for my major, right? But I thought it was going to be helpful. So that's a supporting class. A lot of math in it, though, still, right? And then you take additional courses, like your graduation requirements, right? At the university that I went to to get a Master of Science, you had to take all the courses that I took. To get a Master of Arts, you had to take all the courses I took, and a foreign language. So for me, my foreign language turned out to be my additional work. Guess what has been invaluable to me in schools? My foreign language. Okay? Now, we, there are, numbers get thrown around all the time. 65% to 85% of instruction should be focused on major work of the grade. Right? Great. Okay, I'm going to make sure. I'm going to count up my days right on and on. But you guys, there, there is so much nuance in this. And I really want you to think carefully about these ideas as they come to you. Because it can sound like things written on tablets. You must spend 65 to 85% of your instructional time on major work of the grade. You should spend the vast majority of your time on major work of the grade, but there are all kinds of opportunities, and this is why I call it the nuance of focus, to incorporate other content. So here, it looks like the example's coming up for me. Um, this is seventh grade. I want you to look at cluster B of expressions and equations. Solve real life mathematical problems using numerical and algebraic expressions and equations. And then in geometry in seventh grade, cluster B, solve real life mathematical problems involving angle measure area, surface area, and volume. Oftentimes in schools, we spend the first two thirds to three quarters of our year on major work of the grade and we wait for additional and supporting until after the test. Missed opportunity. Here is the, the, here are the standards. In particular, I want you to look at standard six. You may not be able to read it. I'll read it quickly for you. This is from that geometry cluster B. Um, solve real world and mathematical problems involving area, volume, and surface area of two and three dimensional objects composed of triangles, quadrilaterals, polygons, and right prisms. Um, we also have on the left-hand side, um, this is standard number four. It basically says, I want you to solve real world problems using inequalities, inequalities. Right? Here is a wonderful opportunity to use the context of the additional work to teach the major work of the grade. This is a geometry problem with a bunch of angles in it. 
right? X plus eight degrees, two X minus eight degrees, four X, one of those, is, yeah, four X minus 24 degrees and Y degrees, right? We are using geometry and algebra together at the same time. The context is additional work. To solve it is major work. Do you need to know all of these opportunities in the math standards? No. Should your teachers be getting pretty good at this? Yes. And what questions should you be asking teachers around coherence? Hey, help me understand how, you're making, how you might be putting these two concepts together. Right? So I put it back there for you. Asking questions around coherence because it turns out that when we separate things into individual trees and silos, we forget them. Um, the work of John Bransford et al. out of University of Washington Life Center, he was at Virginia when he started it, on how people learn. Have you read How People Learn? Right? What, what defines an expert? Right? What, what makes experts expert? They have an uncanny ability to chunk information. They take this piece, which looks like its own thing, this piece, which looks like its own thing, this piece, which looks like its own thing, and they say, ah, this whole piece, right? That's expertise. And we're trying to build expertise. They, may not, they won't be experts by the time they leave us, but we want to build toward expertise and help kids see how mathematical ideas interact with one another. And then finally, problems, tasks. Why we do math in the first place? Right, this is this problem, right? Somebody's going to say, I would never do that in the real world, right? Well, you may not do that in the real world, right? But you might be having to build something and want to have a pretty good understanding of how the angles and the triangle work together, right? Moreover, what you are doing here is reasoning. And reasoning is something you will use every day of your life. So let's do a little math. Can you bring up the tasks? You don't have to do them all. <laughs> Hey, you guys, this is third grade. Come on now. You don't have to do them all. Um, first of all, can you read it? OK. So um, this is the work of Smith and Stein, right? They're cognitive demand levels of tasks. Um, and what you see are three different columns. On the left-hand column, there's a lot of, I think it's addition, if I can see from here. Uh, the middle column is geometry, and the right-hand column is multiplication. Right, so those contents are what's in common. Um, the bottom column, right, I'll just read this one to you. Which number combination does not make 20? A, B, C, or D. The next one up, solve each problem, show your work, write an equation. Next problem up. Um, Meredith uses an interesting strategy for solving subtraction problems when you have, uh, when you have to trade. Try to figure out if it works. And then the very top problem, look at the addition, uh, look at the addition strategies below, see if you can figure out how they work. There's Luisa's strategy. Now, try to use Luisa's strategy or Lee's strategy to solve these problems. And then finally, which strategy do you think is easier? Explain. Every column is arranged the same way, right, with the same hierarchy of tasks. Which kinds of tasks are your kids getting most days? Let me take it a step further. Who's getting the top row and who's getting the bottom row? The top row, persevering solving problems, working with challenging tasks, making use of structure, using precision, modeling, application, reasoning, that's mathematical knowledge. Should kids, be, should, all, should kids be doing this all the time? All the time? I don't think so. Right? I mean, you, you do need to build up a little bit. Should you be seeing this very regularly in your classrooms? Do your materials have these kinds of tasks in them? Do your teachers know where to find them if they don't? Do your curriculum directors? Do your coaches? Do you? That's the good stuff, you guys. That's the good stuff. Here's another example. This is one I helped Kristen's son with. Not all tasks are created equal. A girl made three trips to a candy store. This is Algebra 1. Excuse me, honors Algebra 1. 
The first time, she spent $12 on two pounds of jelly beans, three pounds of chocolates. Second time, she spent $15 on a half pound of jelly beans and a quarter pound of lollipops. The last time, she spent $21 on one and a half pounds of jelly beans, two pounds of chocolates, three pounds of lollipops. A, express each type of candy as a variable. B, write a system of equations for each trip to the store. C, how much does one of each type of candy cost? What comes to mind for you when you see this task? Does anybody feel brave enough to raise your hand? I'm going to tell somebody sitting next to you. Yeah, tell somebody sitting next to you. 30 seconds, go. What comes to mind when you read this task? Did you wonder what the standard was? It's A R E I 6. Do you know, here's why that matters. Because the text of AREI 6 is solve systems of equations with a focus on two equations and two unknowns. Two equations, two unknowns. How many equations and how many unknowns do I have up here? Why are we doing three? I've always done three. Come on. Three is what we do. Three is hard. Three is rigorous. It's the same thing as two. It's busy work. Um, did any of you think about scaffolding in the task? Like how much the kids are doing versus how much the task is doing for the kid? If I take A and B away, and I have C only, very different task, isn't it? Very different task. Who's doing the work? Did anybody look at the last question and say, what? How much does one jelly bean cost? You don't have enough information to answer that question. We never tell you. We never tell you what you need to know. So there are two ways to think about that. One is, well, we would want kids to state that assumption and go ahead and solve it. I could see the argument for that. The other argument is, could you write me a better question, please? <laughs> like, say, instead of how much does one of each type of candy cost? Tell me how much does one pound of each type of candy cost, right? Precision matters. Why should we care? Who's getting the good stuff? Is it good stuff to start with? Are people really interrogating the tasks that they're doing? Are they looking at the standards that they're supposed to be writing tasks for or using tasks for? Are they attending to alignment? If they're going beyond the standard, are they doing so with intent? Or are they just doing it because it's what they've always done? Mathematical knowledge is understanding concepts. It's the ability to flexibly use mathematical, mathematics to solve problems, including making sense of and persevering in solving, making and critiquing one's own and others' arguments, looking for and making use of mathematical structure. FOIL is a great mnemonic. It's just distribution. If you understand the distributive property, then you understand FOIL. And the distributive property works every time. FOIL does not. And then easy facility with, uh, with arithmetic and later algebraic and geometric procedures so you can solve problems. And in civics, so you can discern. So you can interrogate arguments. Not people, arguments. So you can make better arguments yourself. You know the Declaration of Independence was written as a geometric proof? Euclid was big in 1776. It was written as a geometric proof, our founding document. So, you guys need to focus on this. You need to, and then somebody told me, you gotta give them something to walk away with, otherwise they're gonna be overwhelmed. So, the progressions. Here's your guiding question. Where does this fit? the interplay and coherence. Is this coherent? And it's really all about the task. Where's the good stuff and who's getting it and who isn't? One of my heroes in the math education community is a guy named Uri Treisman. He's the executive director of the Charles A. Dana Center at the University of Texas at Austin. He's a 
absolute giant in the field. Um, our job as educators is to relentlessly provide access, support, and opportunity. Our job is to tear barricades down, not put more up. Start telling a new story, you guys. Please. Thank you. Thank <clears throat> you.